Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Boyle. Um, I lead the CF Foundation's clinical trials effort, and I'm here with my, my team. Um, just to tell you what to expect for this session, we, we purposely do not have slides. We figured you'd seen enough slides to last a long time. And um, I have a short 45-minute presentation. No, I'm just kidding. The, um, so what I want to do is just to, uh, to introduce some of our team so that you would know what, what, what we're doing and who to talk to if you had questions, but then to dive into questions um, to make sure that everybody who, who came here with something they wanted to ask gets a chance to have that addressed. So, um, you know, my background is I, I ran the CF Center at Johns Hopkins for many years as adult care uh, giver. And then two years ago, I had a chance to, to move to the foundation. Uh, I've been very involved in research at Johns Hopkins and had led the Orcambi trials internationally. But really thought, hey, this would be an amazing opportunity to make a difference for everybody with CF and not just the people at Johns Hopkins. And, and I can tell you that in the last two years, I haven't had a single day when I've said, well, why did I do that? It's just been wonderful. And part of that is because of our team. And so I want to introduce our team, um, starting with Patty Burks, uh, who we're lucky to have. And actually, you know, Patty, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Patty Burks. It's great to be here. Oh, Thanks, Mike. Okay, yeah. I am a nurse. And I did research, I did a CF clinical drug trials for nine years at WashU in St. Louis. I joined the foundation a little over a year and a half ago as director of clinical trial affairs. And it's certainly my joy and privilege to get to work with the 89 research centers across the country, uh, making uh, CF clinical trials available for our patient population. So it's a, it's a joy. I love it. So I'm going to ask you one other thing, Patty. Okay. There's something else that makes you uniquely qualified. Yes. Are you willing to? I, yes. So long before I was ever a research coordinator, long before I was ever a nurse, I was a stay-at-home mom. It's the best job in the world. Um, and my middle child had cystic fibrosis. He passed away when he was 11. That was a long time ago. It was so long ago that the only drugs we had were albuterol, chromalin and mucamist and, and enzymes thank god <laughs> okay ali sue hi everyone my name is ali sue patterson and i work with mike and patty on the clinical trials team and my little piece of the pie is the communications work that we do about clinical research so my job is to make sure that with all the exciting work that Patty is supporting in the network and that Mike is overseeing, that we're communicating accurately and uh, making the information accessible in a way that's easy to understand so that anybody can go to our website, for example, at any time and find the information that they need about what clinical trials are occurring, what drugs are in the pipeline, and um, anything else that they want to learn about clinical research. Fantastic. I'm actually going to brag on Ali Sue for a second, and actually Christina Roman, who was here for the last session. Um, one of the things when we first uh, started saying, okay, how are we going to really rev this up even more to be able to develop, to have more trials, to get more work done, was we said we want to actually make sure that we place the opportunity for people with CF and their families to know exactly what's going on, to go online, to be able to say, oh, this trial is going on here, I want to contact that team find out if I might be eligible, all those things. And so the idea of this clinical trial finder, that would be something like shopping for a purse on Amazon, right? Where you could say, I've got F5 weight Dell, I've got this bacteria, I'm this old, what do you got? And um, that has been, it was about a year long project that got rolled out last year. Ali Sue, actually uh, Patty as well, but Ali Sue played a particularly large part in that. Um, just to give you a, a little insight into the success of that, we, we thought, okay, you always want to measure what your effects are. There was already a clinical trials finder, but it was, it was sort of like a Commodore 64 version of it, right? <laughs> you know what Commodore 64 is? That's, that's going way back. Yeah. Um, it's like Pong, you know, the old video game <laughs> yeah. Pong with the little thing. Um, and then we looked and there were about 80 visits per month to that clinical trial finder. And so we said, okay, that's our baseline. We'd like to increase by 10, 20, 30 percent, we'd really like, maybe more. At the end of the first month, 26,000 visits to the clinical trial finder, and that has actually been maintained, so there's been about 25,000 visits per month, um, which we decided we had definitely hit that 10 to 20 percent increase. In the, uh, so, um, you know, with that, I think this is an exciting time, right, for clinical trials. I, I hope I conveyed that yesterday when we were, when I was talking. 
Um, we're, we're really trying to make sure that we have a, a robust portfolio, not just focused on modulators, although obviously modulators are a big part of future plans. Um, so I'm happy for all of us. We can, we're happy to talk about what we're excited about, but probably more important is to talk about what you're excited about. So why don't we, Betty, you want to do the same thing you did last time? Yes. You want to be the MC and head out to the so, crowd? Um, we'll open it up to questions. Is this working, Ali Sue? I believe it's working. Okay. okay. So you can text in your question. We'd rather you get ask it. Or just raise your hand and I'll just bring the microphone. a little more interactive. So we'll just throw this up open, and if there's nobody who, uh, if there's no questions, then we'll come up with some stuff. But last time we actually ran out of time trying to do questions. So any, anybody here that wants to talk about anything clinical trial related, or truthfully just about anything, please uh, start us off. Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Oh. Oh. I think I saw him. Oh, that's tough. Here. Mark volunteered and they walked right by him. That's right. <laughs> I thought I saw him more determined. Oh. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Patty's Call tough. Lady. She won't. <laughs> Mark can be nice. Go ahead. Hi. Actually, introduce um, yourself, right? That'd be yeah. great. Hi, my name is Nicole Erie. I'm in, currently in the Massachusetts Rhode Island chapter, and I have a daughter with cystic fibrosis, 14 years old. And I was just telling our table mate here that we've been really fortunate uh, that she was on Kaleidico starting when it first came out mm -hmm. um, five years ago and she's doing really well and we're really happy with it and we're told at one point from one of the centers we've moved several times that that was probably going to be it for her that that would be the drug and um, she'd be good to go and then we were told kind of recently ago that that's not the case that there's actually going to be something else coming down the pike that might even be better for her and so I was just curious if you're able to release that information yet about what that drug might be about and how it would be different from Kaleidico and, and an improvement, if you will. Yeah. So do you mind sharing? Uh, sure. So certainly that's, that's good news, yes. right? When they say, hey, this is good, but I, you're just yeah. kidding. We have something better. And that's always good yes. news. Do you mind sharing what her genotype is? Sure. She's the Delta 5 FO8 and yeah. the uh, G551D. Okay, perfect. That's what I was wondering. So this actually goes back to what we were talking about yesterday, which was confusing with the whole 661 trials, the Tezacafter trials, right? And so just as a little bit of a recap with no slides, um, the, the Tezacafter which is this newer version of Lumacafter, the part of Ocambi, um, was testing benefit in basically anybody who had F508 DEL at least on one chromosome. So you had to have at least one F508 DEL. So some of them were people that had two copies, you know, homozygous. Some were people that had one, and on the other side had something that made no protein, a stop mutation or chromosomal deletion. So that's sort of the one end of the spectrum would be two F5 weight DEL, the other one is one F5 weight DEL, and then something that doesn't have any, of, you know, make any protein at all. And then a couple other combinations in there. Some were ones that had G551D, or residual function. Uh, G551D, or well, I should say gating mutations, and other ones were the residual function. So really it all comes down to what's the pair do. The, the quick and take home message for you is that we know that for the G551D, Kaleidico is great. We're happy about that. We know the data just keeps mounting up about the benefits of that, how it stabilizes lung function, all those things. But your, it's your, your son, your daughter, your daughter has F5 weight down on the other side. So the question is, could there be some treatment for that? And the bottom line is that that study for people that had F5 weight down on one side and a gating mutation on the other, such as G551D, showed that they had more benefit from the combination. It was about a 7% improvement in their lung function. Um, that that was actually larger than just the Ivacafter alone. And so that's a long way of saying there's a good chance that when the FDA looks at this, they're going to say if you have F5 weight DEL on one side and a gating mutation on the other, that you could benefit from taking this combination. So it, it, yes, it's one of these things that yes, Kaleidico is good, but this might be even better because you're gonna be treating all, both sides. Plus there's some evidence that truthfully this combination may have more effect on the G551D. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy for you, for you and for your daughter and for anybody else with those because I think that will be something that will add an additional benefit. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat that question because that's a really, really good question. This comes up all the time. Let's say that your son or you or your daughter has um, a new modulator that comes on, you're excited about it, and you say, well, wait a second, they already have a lot of lung damage, they have diabetes, they have pancreatic insufficiency, how much can we reverse? 
right? Well, some of this we're studying, and, and, and the bottom line is that there's probably a little bit more reversibility for some of these things than we thought, but there are some things that we can't fix. So for lung disease, we know that lung function can go up 10, 15, even 20% sometimes, but it's not gonna undo all the bronchiectasis that's there. But it's more reversible than we probably thought if you had a really potent. For the pancreas, there's two different things the pancreas done. One is it secretes enzymes. Truthfully, once you get past the age of probably three or four, taking modulators won't restore pancreatic function. What's very interesting is there's a little bit of evidence that if you start really early in life, as in maybe below the age of two, that you might be able to protect the pancreas. And I won't go into all the details, but there's some exciting data that says, hey, the pancreas actually can be a little bit rescued if you start really early in life with these. As for diabetes, the answer is it won't undo it, but there's several studies the foundations uh, supported, including one from Philadelphia, that shows that actually it does help with some of your insulin secretion. So remember, adults, about 25 to 30 percent of adults develop diabetes. There's some evidence if you have a modulator that's working, that actually it might delay that some, and actually may decrease the amount of insulin you need. It's something we're studying pretty hard right now, but it, it won't reverse it. Our real hope, though, would be as we get approval and better things to move earlier and earlier, that this would eventually prevent a lot of those problems. We don't know yet. So we're going to have to follow. So we're going we're to see. Okay? All right. Next question. Hello. Uh, my name is David Buzzard. Uh, my wife, Linda, and I have a daughter uh, who is about five, will be five in May who has cystic fibrosis. Um, and shortly after she was born, we uh, partook in a clinical trial. Um, but um, after we partook in it, I didn't really know about any of the results. My question is, once we partake in a clinical trial, or if a patient does, how will we know the results, um, and, and when does it usually, uh, what's the timeline it usually takes from that point? Thank you. I'm going to start with that, but then I'm going to pass the mic to Ali Sue, who's actually worked on this, because this is a great point. Um, I think the first thing always is to to talk with your team that's doing the clinical trials, because they, they're the ones who actually will have the, the results the quickest. And I will tell you that it takes a while, and that's because after that trial is done, even when they, they finish enrollment, they do a thing where they actually have to lock the database. It takes months until they actually finally say, okay, we're going to release and really what we call unblind the study, because that's what you want to know. Right? Was I on drug or not? That's oftentimes, and then, and then also, how did this study work? If you, it, I should say, if you just want the results of the trial, that's usually released as a press release at some point. If you want to know what was I on, that takes a little bit longer when they unblind the trial. But this has been such a common question about how do I know, not only about something I was in, or what about these other trials I'm hearing about, that Ali Sue has come up with a solution. So Ali Sue, you want to talk about I, that? I didn't come up with it, um, but I did help with it. So <laughs> the clinical trial finder, which launched last summer, so it is relatively new, has a filter. Um, you can go in there and click studies with results, and it will show you only studies that have published results. Um, so that means either a press release or a journal article or something of that nature. Um, and what our job is on our team is to summarize those results from, for example, a scientific journal, which no one wants to sift through. And even if you did, it would be almost impossible to really glean the key points in a timely manner. So our job is to summarize those into um, a user-friendly format. It's never longer than a couple paragraphs, and it, the aim is to give you the key information that's relevant to you, someone who participated in the study, whether that's yourself or, or a loved one or a child. Um, so if you know, in your case, you participated in a specific trial, you can go to the trial finder and just search for the name of the trial, um, or you can filter down until you find it. Um, and then to Mike's point, if you're looking for results of any study for any reason, if you're just curious what happened to a specific drug, you can go to the finder and just click studies with results, and that'll show you every study that has published results, and you can peruse that way. Um, and then another cool feature is that the, the finder and the drug development pipeline on CFF.org are actually linked to one another. So if you click into the clinical trial finder and you are looking through a study um, and its results, it'll list the study drug as a hyperlink. And if you click on the name of the study drug, it'll take you to that drug's page on the pipeline, which has a little bit more information, less about the studies, but more about the drug itself, what phase of development it's in, and whether those study results influenced the drug development path at all. Um, and then vice versa, from the pipeline, if you click on a drug, it lists 
on the right-hand side of the page all the trials that are either occurring now or have occurred previously for that specific drug, and you can click directly into the trial finder that way. I'm going to tell one funny story briefly, and that was at one point when we looked at the pipeline, we were trying to make it so great, and I said, wouldn't it be great if you could click on the pipeline, the, the bar there, and it would give you lots of information about that, and Alex said, you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> so, so the whole goal of this would be not only that the clinical trial finder um, helps you find stuff that's ongoing, but it'll be become basically a place where you can go back and look at the results. You can sort of see the story of how this has played out over time. So, good. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is John Uh-oh. You can actually take, why don't you come get this one, Patty? But go ahead. You seem like you can be loud. And he recently, recently participated in a clinical trial specifically designed for CF adults with advanced lung disease. And I think it was on Oricombi, and it really didn't do much, to be honest with you, um, at least for him. I don't know what the mm -hmm. results of the full trial were. But I was wondering, are there other clinical trials specifically designed to try to help some of the adults that have um, advanced lung disease because, aside from the fact that their two-thirds of the lungs are gone, um, you know, some of these drugs don't seem to have as much of an effect on the older population as they do the younger population. Yeah. So I think everybody got that. But the real question is, so a lot of times clinical trials have this limitation where you say if your FEV1 is below 40 percent or below 30 percent, you're not eligible for the trial. And so you say, well, what about, what about that? So that's, there's a lot of people out there that could be benefiting. So the reason they do that is actually because anytime you're looking at an experimental drug, you're not sure if it's going to be side effects. And so you don't want to move that into a group that maybe is more vulnerable, right? So you're a little afraid. And truthfully, that trial was specifically designed to say, okay, can or could or can be actually cause some trouble in some of these uh, people with lower lung function. It was trying to determine safety. And so um, the answer is it depends. It depends on the stage of the drug. And that they are oftentimes, um, the early ones, they're not going to be saying, let's use this in a group who's more sick because it's safety. We always want truth, we always want to have safety first. The one thing I will say, though, is that there are times, particularly when it starts to show promise for a new drug, where there are oftentimes compassionate use protocols, where if you don't qualify because your lung function's below 40% or 30%, the company, once they actually have enough evidence this could benefit, they often work with the FDA to say, hey, we're going to start to make this available to people, truthfully not as a trial, but actually as compassionate use. And so I don't know if this fully answers your question. We're trying to lower, particularly for some of the trials that, we don't, that we're happy about the safety, we're trying to lower that, that FEV1 percentage. We're never going to go too low because we don't want to be doing something that we might have side effects in a group that could, we don't want to cause trouble. But for that group, if we start to see that there's some benefit, we are pushing hard for companies to have compassionate use programs so they can get early access to drugs that look promising. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna add one other thing because this is gonna come up at some point. The other thing that comes up with this all the time is difficult to treat infections. This is one of the most common questions about, okay, I can't be in this trial because I have sepatia or I have abscesses. And so we are rarely focusing on trying to develop New, new trials and new therapies in a couple of specific tough-to-treat areas. This includes tough-to-treat pseudomonas, tough-to-treat non-tuberculous mycobacteria, such as Mycobacterium abscessus and MAC, Burkholderia sepatia, Acromobacter is another one that can be challenging. And so um, there will be specific trials for those. Um, because those oftentimes require a unique approach, whereas sometimes just the lower lung function, people are a little hesitant to go charging in, if that makes sense. Okay. Yes, Mark. She finally came back to Yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering, you know, as you think about these drugs, the correctors or what have you, um, and I know that there's an issue about the liver as far as, you know, whatever they put the liver. Yeah. You know, safety issues. Uh -huh. So, will the drug, I know the drug could potentially have a risk to the liver, but would the drug potentially correct 
the liver as well. Okay. And, and how do you yes. think about I think we've, we've talked diabetes. about this a little bit before. I didn't give me an update. So I'm going to repeat the question so people understand. You know, every time we test a drug, we always think about the lungs, right? Everybody says, what's the lung function effect? Are they sick less? But the truth is, we spend a lot of time thinking about other organs. Could it affect the kidneys? Could it affect the liver? Because many new drugs somehow interact with the liver and can cause trouble. And early on, with, for instance, with Kaleidico, and with some of these, there was concern, okay, are there some problems with inflammation in the liver? The good news about this is that so far, um, the modulators have been tolerated very well in, in the liver in terms of side effects. This is a lot of monitoring that goes on with that, and there haven't been a lot of problems either related to our CAMBI or um, with Tezacaftor that actually cause side effects in the liver, that cause liver inflammation. So that's great news. There's something else, though, and that is you asked about, okay, could this actually help your liver? And the answer is we think so. As a matter of fact, the thing that's pretty neat is if you look at the liver function tests, the LFTs, so AST, ALT, ALKFOS, the typical things that you get checked in clinic each year, if you look at that for people when they start on modulators, they actually tend to come down in general. And that's because the, you have CFTR that lines your bile ducts as well in the liver. And it, the same sludging you get in your lungs with thick mucus, you can get some of that in your liver as well. Many of you have, have experienced this or your children have experienced this. And so there is some evidence that actually being on modulators may help with that and, and help over time. This is a really slow moving disease. As you know, you follow it for years and years, and so we don't have evidence yet, because it hasn't been long enough, to say if you're on these modulators, it's going to prevent some of the scarring, cirrhosis, those type of things down the road. But there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about that. Um, the last part is, another thing in the liver, is just the whole uh, drug interactions part. Because the liver is really, it's the, it's the part that clears a lot of these drugs. And so if one drug is causing the liver to be, liver to be real active, it may clear out another one of your drugs you're on. It's one of the reasons why with what can be, you can't take antifungals. Oral contraceptives don't work as well because the liver is clearing it out. The good news about the Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, this new drug, um, it has a lot less effect on the drug interactions part in the liver. So I know there was about three different parts to that. We've seen that those modulators in general are safe for the liver. There is some evidence in the long run that they may actually be helpful, although we need to see that more. The newer drug, Tezacaftor probably has less of the drug interactions involving the litter, liver than or can be, and that's actually one of the nice things about it. So, all right. We Other have a questions? virtual yeah. question. Oh, um, hey, virtual question, yeah. What advice would you give to a mom or dad with a young child that qualifies for a clinical trial? Oh, I want that. I know, I was going to say, so I was gonna say <laughs> Patty, Patty, go to town. Okay. You're more qualified to answer this than I am for sure. Um, I would uh, learn all I could about the trial. I would talk with the care provider that my child has to make sure they agree that it's a good idea, and then I would dive in with both feet and run as fast as I can to get involved. Um, there's a lot of ways that safety is protected through the course of a study. And uh, before it ever gets down into children, it's already been tested in adults. Before it gets down to young children, it was tested in older children. There's lots and lots of ways that safety is protected. And that's good to know. But, but truthfully, uh, if I thought there was a trial for my kid, I would read up on it. I would contact my physician. I heard one mom say they called their physician and just had one question. Can you give me any reason we shouldn't do this? <laughs> and then she signed her kid up the next week. But I would contact the physician and then I would run and I would get her done. Things are moving fast in CF and you don't want to miss your opportunity. Mm -hmm. So Patty, I'm going to ask you another question related to that because Patty actually gets amazing. She personally calls every one of the uh, research centers in the country to discuss how things are going over the course of the year and discusses that with them and also has been very involved with people that have been involved with trials and trying to get feedback saying, hey, what we can do better. So I guess I would be interested, Patty, and maybe Alice, you can chip in on this as well, but for people who have participated in trials, what are some of the things that they've commented as being either they like or they don't like about it? So I've gotten to, I've had the wonderful opportunity to talk to many adults and um, parents, children uh, who've participated in trials. I, one comment I remember is a mom whose baby, an 18-month-old, participated in an interventional modulator trial. 
uh, she said, I know my daughter, when she's old enough to understand what she did, will be proud of it. And, uh, and her hope was one day, when a family gets the diagnosis, they'll also get the prescription. And she knew her daughter played a role in that day coming. So uh, I've had many conversations uh, with families uh, one, I remember uh, they told me they lived in um, Utah, the study was in Seattle, and again it was a baby, about a six month old, and the, the um, site flew her, her husband, and her two kids in for the screening visit. They needed to explain it to both parents and have both parents consent to partake in the trial, but they were t she was telling me, oh my gosh, they flew us in, they had someone meet us and take us to the hotel. They, they did all they could to take good care of us so we could think clearly and make a good decision. And she was really surprised at how well they were cared for. Other parents have told me they're shocked at how well the research site and the care center communicate with each other so that everyone's understanding what's going on and if there's ever a safety issue regarding the study or a health issue going on at the care center that both teams are aware and, and sometimes families have been very surprised at how well that communication takes place. Ali Sue, do you have anything to add? Um, I would say that a lot of the things we've heard uh, that are maybe not so positive after participating in a trial, such as, um, to your point earlier, you know, how do I find out information about what happened? Um, especially if you participated at a trial that was not at your site, your regular care team probably doesn't even have the answer to your question. So I think a lot of the things that I'm working on in the capacity of our team is to make that information as available as possible um, and to address those concerns so that you don't have to wonder what happened after you participate or um, if, you're, if you're thinking about enrolling, that information about clinical research in a broader sense, you know, what a trial is and what it might look like from start to finish, what, what the process is, all of that information is, is clearly explained on our website and available to you all. Um, we, have, we have a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm just going to make two points that I think came up from the last session. I think they're really important. So one is just to realize there's over 50 clinical trials right now. There's no center who's going to have do all 50. Right? And so it's one of the reasons why it's worthwhile looking at the clinical trial finder, trying to decide, okay, what's the right fit for me or for my child? Um, and um, it doesn't mean anything bad about your site at all. As a matter of fact, that's part of the strategy because there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of regulatory stuff that goes into actually just getting the trial going. We want to actually spend time with enrolling people and getting the answers and not just doing the paperwork. So part of that would be realizing that uh, you may need to look around, particularly if there's uh, specific trials that you're interested in. The other thing I'd say is that everybody wants to be in, involved in that trial, that it's the one that's the breakthrough, that says, hey, I got this drug, it's amazing, and uh, that's our goal. But we know that there's going to be trials where we get the answer, and the answer is no, this wasn't actually quite good enough, that that is actually a real contribution as well. And, and truthfully, what it does is it allows us to continue to focus on, okay, which are the ones that are moving forward? So, you know, I, I, I've participated in some trials that have been incredibly successful and some other ones where at the end of the day we said, okay, guess what? Back to the drawing board. But each time I really tried to make it clear to the people who participated that they played an incredibly important role because it allows us to sort of weed out and actually to end up with those things that are going to make a difference for people with CF. So. Um, let's do, let's actually, we're going to do, let's, let's alternate back to the room and make sure we get any questions for people that are here. Any other questions that people want to ask? Oh, yes, Mark. Mark Harvey from yeah. Oklahoma City. The thing that, that we've been talking about is we're getting more modulators, we're looking at other, other uh, channels to modulate, we're anti-inflammatories, we're treating. Our concern is how much of the CFTR do you turn on, you know, what is 30 percent, is it 76 percent, and then how does that play with, we now, you know, I'm thinking 15, 20 years ago we had a handful, 15, 20 years from now we may have a hundred different things that we're doing. How do we, how do you think about designing trials to decide, you know, do you, could, do you use Azithromax, do you use, which modulator do you use, because my concern as obviously my children are moving into you know that adult and they're going to different clinics each clinic has different expertise 
they each have their own model. My concern is as this gets even more, it hasn't been very complex to this point, but it's about to become very complex. Yeah. So how do you think that, the, that we'll move forward with trials to help create clinical guidelines so it is not complex at the grassroots? Right. Well, that's a great question. It's, it's complicated in some ways. I think that our first goal, truthfully, is to come up with um, effective, th really effective therapies. And then the next thing would be to say, okay, it'd be nice to have more than one company. It'd be nice to have multiple options. And then you start saying, okay, well, what, what's the approach? How do you decide which one to use? Um, that um, there's a couple of different approaches to that. I, I don't think we're going to be having true trials where we say, okay, you take or can be, or you take Tezacaft, or you take this other one, and we sort of go head to head, because just the, the economics of that don't work. Um, but what we are realizing that we're gonna probably need to do in the future is to be able to do other ways of measuring to figure out what's the best match for each individual. You know, we hear about precision medicine all the time. It's a very sexy term. This, we're really at the cutting edge here of trying to think what's the right thing for your child, your child, for this, you know, each person. One of the ways we can do that, besides clinical trials, potentially, is actually by using laboratory models. And this was mentioned a little bit in, in some of the presentations, and Bill Sketch talked about it, this idea of can we take nasal cells or intestinal cells, put them in the dish that belong to that person, and actually test a couple of different new therapies and to see which of those work best. Now, in order to really be serious about this, you have to have uh, multiple options, but this would be something in the future. We're actually starting to try to work on this right now. As a matter of fact, um, we have a meeting later on this month with a bunch of the world's experts. One of the world's experts in this is actually a guy named Jeff Beekman from the Netherlands. He's the guy that does, does those little balls of uh, cells that fluoresce that you saw that Bill Sketch was showing that they swell and they don't. Because what we'd like to be able to do is to say, can we correlate what happens in the dish with what happens with people? And that would actually allow us to be able to start to sort out some of this real precision medicine. I think your other question about how about, how does this work with azithromycin? Or if you're taking this medicine, do you still have to take Toby or whatever? Um, that's gonna be something that we'll be, we'll probably do through the registry. Right, because people will be doing some natural experiments there and we want to follow and to say, okay, the people who are staying on both are doing better. It's probably not going to be a trial, most likely. Um, and um, anyway, it, it is going to be complicated, but it, truthfully, if, if the problem is we have so many therapies we're trying to figure out, that's a, that's a nice problem to have. The last thing I'll say is think about what the future is going to be. Eventually, we're going to be using modulators to treat people before they have lung damage. So right now, we're talking a lot about antibiotics and all these things, but our goal is eventually that people would start you know, early on so that maybe they never have to have as much time taking Pulmozyme or taking um, inhaled antibiotics because they haven't developed some of that structural lung disease. So I think it's going to be, I'm not pretending to have all the answers here, we're going to work together on all of this, but we, we completely agree that it's going to be something we're going to have to sort through. Our first goal right now is to say, let's get those modulators and then to sort out some of the complicated part. Um, and so we're starting to work on that now. All right, other questions in the room? Ali, see you said there was some. Yeah, we have two here. Uh, the first one, can we expect more trials for mycobacterium abscessus therapy to be coming? Okay, yeah, so I would hinted a little bit before about abscessus, mycobacterium abscessus. This is a difficult to treat infection that is still fairly rare, thankfully, but can be really tough to treat. It's demoralizing. It can lead to months and months or sometimes even years of IV antibiotics. Um, so the short answer to that is yes. Um, we've actually put together um, a consortium or in the process of putting together a consortium of centers who are going to focus on these type of trials because they require some special some specialization to be able to do this um, that we already have a couple of approved drugs which um, will be tested in this by as an add-on to current therapy Gallium is one that has shown some evidence against abscesses. One of the patients that I've had in a trial, actually a previous gallium trial, had a clear response. Um, and that's actually, that trial's ongoing now, so we'll figure out if that helps. But then we're also trying to think for the future, and I, I can't remember if we talked about this yesterday or not, but that we're actually partnering with the Gates Foundation 
to try to screen, to look for some new therapies for difficult to treat non-tuberculous mycobacteria infections such as abscesses. And just the two minutes about that is that the Gates Foundation is focused on tuberculosis, the classic, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, India, big uh, health care problem. And they've recruited a bunch of the major drug companies to screen to look for new therapies for classic TB. It turns out that Obsessus and MAC are cousins of classic TB. And, it, um, and I'll give Preston Campbell and I, the real credit for this idea. He said, hey, I wonder if there's some overlap between what they're finding for this TB screening, where they're spending millions of dollars and they've already got all these leads. Could it also uh, work for some of our patients for Obsessus? And so the answer is about a third of the time, 20 to 30 percent of the time, there is some overlap. And so some of those new agents that they're discovering actually do have activity against uh, abscesses. So right now what we're trying to do is to select out the best leads of those. We have had regular meetings with the Gates Foundation and truthfully with some of the scientists who are doing the work. The idea would be to take those leads to optimize them by changing the molecules. And the way you do that is you think, okay, how are they going to be absorbed? How is it going to last in the body? And you tinker with the molecule and then that would go into trial. So I think there's some short-term uh, trials, which we'll see uh, probably in the next year or so. Um, gallium's ongoing, and then in the next couple of years, we'll see some of those leads come forward. It's certainly something that's important to us. Every company we talk to, that's one of the ones that we, that's thinking about anti-infective, that's one of the ones that we bring up. So, um, any other questions? So, Patty, I'm going to ask, because you've been quiet here, um, are there other things that you think would be important to to, to bring up or because that, that uh, you see the whole picture right. so you see the whole picture in your role are there things you wanted so to mention obviously there's a lot of parents in this room and um, trying to weigh out whether your child participates in trial is really a, a very difficult decision and it's kind of easy sometimes for us to be of course why wouldn't you but it is a difficult thing to weigh out and um, and it's just fine to choose not to do it if you choose not to do it, your care center is going to love you every bit as much as they've ever loved you, mm -hmm. and science will move forward. So I really want to tell you it, that's a, that is an honorable decision. Mm -hmm. It's also fine to choose to do it, and there's a lot of good reasons to choose to do it. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but if you decide to be in a clinical trial and a couple months in you realize this is not what you thought it would be, do you know, let me ha have a raise of hands, what can you do? Are you stuck in the trial till death do us part? Raise your hand if that's what you think. <laughs> no. no, you can say, you know what, I'm done, thank you, <laughs> but we need to quit. And usually the site would like to have one more visit to do safety follow-up on your child, which is in your best interest to make sure their labs and everything are just as good as they were when you started. But you can always the door is always open for you to enter into clinical trials if that's something you want to do. And it's always open for you to walk out if you decide it's not what you thought it would be or your kid is paying a higher price than you're willing to see them pay. It's just wanted to make that very clear. And then one other concept that I think a lot about, I, you know, I already shared that I had a child with CF and I kind of joke about the drugs that were available, albuterol, mucomist, and chromalin. Um, that's, that's the truth. In the 80s, that's what we had. Every generation of us parents and uh, adults that have CF have participated in trials so that slowly more drugs have, been beco have become available to, our, to this patient population, right? And we all are the beneficiaries of the generation before us. And that just touches me deeply. Hmm that there have been families that have sacrificed and done the very inconvenient thing to participate in a trial so that kids today have proven and safe treatments. Mm. That's just kind of cool. Good That's here. just kind of awesome. That's great. Yes. And of course, I'm willing to do a trial, but like I was just looking at the. Say that. Tresvactor? Tresvactor? Yeah. No, he's not helping me. Tresvactor, yes. Yeah. Um, 
And there's no, for, I was looking for six and up, and my son is 17 months, so I would be willing to do the two and up. Because now, you know, but that's not even, there's not even one located in Texas. So how do you, you know, because I drive to Houston, I would drive, but yes. how do you figure out what, where the clinical trials are going to take place? Okay. So I think there's a couple questions in there. So the truth is there are fewer trials for very young, pe young patients, right? And that's because you don't really do trials in them oftentimes until you've demonstrated that it's really uh, safe and everybody else. And usually when you get down to that, young group, really what you're trying to do is you figure out dosing. Dosing is very different in clearance and all those type of things. And so there aren't that many trials, um, realistically. Um, so if there are, then you can go into the clinical trial finder, the CFF.org, and you can actually go do your age, and it'll tell you everything that's available. The one thing I would say, for instance, with that zero to two trial, there's, there's again, it depends on your genotype, if it's modulators and those type of things, but a lot of these trials, particularly if they're um, for smaller groups, companies are willing to pay for you to travel, right? And so, um, obviously, it's most convenient if it's right down the street and you can hop over after school or whatever after, uh, you, you know, sometime during the day. But if there's a trial that you really want to participate in, it's only at a place that's far away, absolutely contact the site. Because oftentimes the companies say they, they are more interested in enrolling their trial and they oftentimes will provide uh, the ability to travel and those type of things. And it depends on each trial. Um, so hope that answers your question. I mean, sometimes there's just not trials for little ones. Usually when there is, it's because there's a specific reason, and then we love it when people enroll, that um, if uh, you want to know, look at the clinicaltrials.org. You can go through, or not clinicaltrialscff.org uh, and clinical trials finder. And then realize that if you have to travel, that's something that talk to the sites about. They can help you with. So. You know, I think we're going to probably, I'm happy to keep answering questions afterwards, but I'm going to say, since it's the end of, end of our time, you know, hopefully you've sensed how there's progress literally every six months, right? And that's not, that's not something that you can say for most diseases. At Hopkins, when I ran, uh, I helped to run our pulmonary division at Johns Hopkins, and people always come up and say, how do you guys do that? How do you guys do that? And what I would say is it's the community, it's the foundation. What we have is something that's unique. And so I just want to thank you for being part of it. Say, hey, we, we, there's better things to come. We're, we're on a roll and we're going to keep going. That it's going to be not just for certain types, we're going to get to everybody so that everybody is going to be able to benefit. So um, look forward to seeing you again next year and, and telling you what's new uh, a year from now. Thank you very much.